three, shall we kick it off? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to MakerBot. We've got a great evening for you. What is it? Is it the nerd? Rapture of the nerds. Rapture of the nerds. So I'm just going to hand it over to these guys and we're off to the races. Hi folks, um, I'm, I'm Corey and this is Charlie Strauss and um, thank you all for coming tonight and especially thank you to Bree and the, the MakerBotters for uh, opening up the bot cave to us. Um, we actually came to New York to do a, a, a little gig inside of Google's New York office and I really wanted to do something public. And I thought about, you know, like looking for one of the bookstores I love in New York because there's so many great bookstores, but I thought, holy shit, if Bree would open up the bot cave to us, how awesome would that be? Uh, and Bree not only opened it up to us, but he printed our heads, and I think you guys get to take them. Um, so, you need some Sharpies for coloring them. Yeah, that's Price right. The best color there. Yeah, I look good with a little Fu Manchu mustache, just for the record. Is this uh, guy Lenin? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We're touring this book that we just finished, uh, or that we that has just come out, Rapture of the Nerds. Uh, this is our third stop. Yesterday was Lexington. We had Google today, and then we're here. And tomorrow we're in uh, uh, Boston, and then we're off to Rochester for an IEEE thing. Um, so this is a, a, a quick stop. Uh, Rapture of the Nerds. The way that we've been doing this this tour is, um, I give like a kind of five minute spiel about the book. Charlie gives a five minute spiel about the book. I do like a seven minute reading. Charlie does a seven minute reading, and then we take your questions. Is that Sound good to everyone? I know it's a it's a crowded room. Uh, and then I think there's a bookseller here, right? Oh, hi there. Uh, there's a bookseller selling books, so you can get the books and you can we'll, we'll sign them for you. I love defacing books, anything to render them non-returnable. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so a little bit about the rapture of the nerds. So the, the um, Charlie uh, uh, wrote to me about seven years ago uh, we'd been corresponding on the on the internet as you do with. Why with, don't we write a short story together? I said. Yeah. Nice uh, short, self-contained. Let's project. write a little story. It'll just take us a couple of weeks, uh, and which we then spent the next seven years working on. So, um, Charlie sent me about a thousand words of a story called Jury Service that was about the weirdest thing I'd ever read, and I was like, all right, challenge accepted. I added another five hundred words of the weirdest stuff I could think of, which Charlie proceeded to top and back and forth it went until we finished the story Jury Service which was published on sci-fi.com. And uh, that story was very well received, so much so that um, uh, Lou Anders, who was editing a magazine then called Argozy, which was like a little trade paperback every quarter, nice idea, didn't last, solicited a, another novella from us called Appeals Court, and we wrote that, and there it lay for uh, many years, and Tor would periodically say, do you guys want to write like a novel based on this? Maybe you could write a third part and rewrite it. And we, we kept saying, yeah, someday when we have the time, Finally, all the stars aligned. We wrote this. No, no, no. You've missed out the important bit. The Locust April Fool's joke. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. Do you want me to do that? Yeah, you do that yeah, part. Yeah, okay. Locust Magazine. Trade magazine of the SF field. Um, every year they run April Fool news items. And about two years ago they ran an April Fool's item. Stross and Doctoro signed to write authorized sequel to Atlas Shrug. <laughs> <laughs> In which the children of um, whatever Ayn Rand's protagonists were in that book, I have not read it sort of get together the, um, a generation later and set up a socialist utopia. <laughs> and, and this joke was apparently so great, they, they mentioned a seven-figure advance, which is quite flattering. And the person who fell for it? Yes, yeah, so the joke was so compelling that many people fell for it, including Spider Robinson, who had just written a posthumous novel with uh, from a Heinlein manuscript. And can uh, you have flattered that he thought we were worth a seven-digit advance? That's right. So he wrote to me and he was like, you know, congratulations, if you want any advice on, like, following on from a dead author's work, you know, I'm available. And I was like, you know, Spider, today if you look up gullible in the dictionary, there is your face. Um, so we wrote this book and it's called Rapture of the Nerds. The title uh, comes from uh, the uh, uh, famed libertarian Trotskyist science fiction writer, uh, Scottish science fiction writer, there's lots of them. This was the one in Scotland, uh, Ken MacLeod who one day observed that the singularity, this idea that someday uh, we'll put our heads and our brains into computers and all kind of disappear from this earthly flesh and become kind of simulations inside of computers, that this idea was kind of like the idea of the rapture, the Christian rapture, but for geeks. Um, instead of having a left behind story where like the pious and the, and the believers and people who really dig, you know, Bronze Age uh, philosophy disappear from the earth and go to a, a, a heavenly afterlife, leaving behind the, you know, the godless to kind of duke it out on, on what's left of the planet. Instead, 
all of the kind of hyper-rational nerdy people disappear from the earth because their brains have been uploaded to a computer and all that's left behind are the religious people. <laughs> so we, we kind of took that idea and, and ran with it and, and really wrote what I think of as a kind of progressive apocalypse story. So, um, you know, back in the, uh, in, the, in the olden times before the Enlightenment, uh, the, the dominant uh, way of seeing the world was Lapsarian, at least in the kind of Abrahamic tradition, that um, we, had, we had left the garden, we'd fallen from grace, and every generation things would only get worse until the apocalypse. And it's easy to understand how you might have arrived at that philosophy in those days. After all, the older you get, the clearer it is that the world is getting worse, right? I mean, what, weren't all the colors brighter a few years ago? <laughs> Didn't everything taste better? Weren't the people of your preferred gender more interesting to look at? You know, did, didn't, didn't everything hurt less in those days? And certainly the children were more respectful and better behaved. Um, but, but as a species, I think the human race is not very comfortable with unbounded conditions. You know, the idea that things would just continue to get worse surely must reach a point of no return when none more worse is attained. Um, when, when, you know, things just get so bad that the earth ceases to exist as we understand it, the apocalypse arrives, right? And, and that's, you know, we have to stick boundary conditions on these unbounded uh, curves. Now, with the Enlightenment, you get this idea of, of um, standing on the shoulders of giants, of progress, of, of things getting better and better. And, you know, this is a story that we've continued into this modern age with Moore's Law and the idea that processor curves will double every, every couple of years forever and ever, you know, screaming skyward at, at, at infinity um, until, like, computers get so fast and ubiquitous and cheap that, like, everything is made of them and there's nothing we can't compute, in, you know, just by thinking about it. And, and again, we're not very good at unbounded systems. So when you start to think about this, well, you know, what do you arrive at? You arrive at the idea that we'll, we're going to hit a break with history. Things will get none more better, and we'll, the balloon will burst. And again, it's, it's easy how you can arrive at it, because didn't the technology all used to seem more reasonable and easy to understand? Doesn't it seem like we've entered an era in which it's just impossible to keep up with what's going on? And certainly the children used to be much better behaved. <laughs> um, so that's where we got to with this book. And, and you know, Charlie has some things to say about um, where the singularity came from, uh, some provocative notions that are reflected in the book too. Yeah. Um, okay, on the origins of a singularity, um, how many people here have read Raymond Kurt's file? Okay, how many people here have read Werner Vinge? Okay, how many people here have read Nikolai Fedorov? Aha! Ooh, right, okay. Um, now, the recent terminology for singularity was pretty much coined in its current sense by Werner Vinge in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Werner was a, is a professor, well, retired now, professor of computer science, and he was trying to pinned the tail on a thought that had been eluding him for a while concerning the possibility of strong artificial intelligence. Now, as a computer scientist, one of the, one of the obsessions with, of, of CS experts over the past 50 years has been, can we make a machine that thinks, ever since Turing published his paper on thinking machines in the 1940s. Um, Werner was reasoning along slightly different lines. Let us postulate that we can make a piece of software that is able to solve problems, to cogitate, to actually think like a human being, or with equivalent outputs to a human being. Um, it follows that if this is actually a piece of software, we can throw faster hardware at it, and it will run faster. And I refer you to my friend Mr. Dr. O's previous comment on expectations of progress. It will get much, much faster. Now, second postulate Werner came up with is, we know that we are smarter than frogs. Anyone here not as smart as a frog? Good. Depends on the frog. Okay. But anyway, let us postulate that there are forms of reasoning, forms of consciousness that are as much more effective or powerful than human reasoning, as human reasoning is more powerful than that of, say, a regular amphibian. Um, let us further hypothesize that such a form of reasoning is also amenable to automation. If human-grade intelligences can come up with such an algorithm, then it seems obvious that human-equivalent AIs running much, much faster than real-time will come up with it fairly soon in human terms after they come into existence. So you effectively get an explosion of intelligence 
and we have no idea where such superhuman intelligences would go other than we're not in the driving seat anymore, we're frogs. Looking at a road we're trying to cross to get to the uh, sewage farm on the other side, because it's nice and wet. Now, Werner came up with this and started writing novels around this idea in the late 80s, early 90s. Meanwhile, a whole bunch of other folks had been discussing similarish ideas, um, and they put two and two together and got 42 or thereabouts. Um, I will refer anyone who remembers it to the Extropians mailing list on the internet in the late 1980s, early 1990s, where a lot of the ideas of modern transhumanism were doing the rounds. Uh, cryonicists were there, libertarians were there, um, proponents of magic fluffy nanotech foo-foo were there, <laughs> um, proponents of AI were there. And they were all sort of seeding together in this big agglomeration of interesting cross-fertilizing memes. And um, along the way, we got into the topic, they got into the topic of mind uploading. The idea that you could basically map the connectome of a human brain without killing it and run the connectionist neural network that gives rise to human consciousness as an artificial intelligence in silicon, as it were. Now, this somehow led people to start speculating about um, the rapture of the nerds in the sense of uploading everybody into computer land, having a beautiful simulated universe that is much more pleasant to live in than our current world, and um, before you knew it, we had the rapture of the nerds. We had people coming up to Charlie's and convention parties and asking when uploading would be available so they could get rid of the meat puppets. Um, you know, I, I was always tempted to reply, you know, maybe if you bathed a bit more often and looked after the meat puppet, you wouldn't be so keen to upload and get away from it. <laughs> but, um, anyway, further digging, though, shows that this sort of um, almost Christian fundamentalist rapture outlook on the prospects for technology goes back a long way. Um, look back to the 1920s, as Ken McLeod pointed out, and there was a whole extropian movement among the Leninists, the Russian cosmists, who um, were all in favour of, once we've achieved communism, true communism on Earth with new Soviet man, the classic formulation, always jammed tomorrow, we need to conquer and explore the cosmos. We need to colonise the universe. We need to develop medical technologies to provide immortality. And, you know, um, they were drawing on earlier wellsprings of um, extropian optimism. Uh, they go back to a guy called uh, Nikolai Fedorov, a Russian Orthodox theologian in the late 19th century, and the teacher of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the guy who came up with a rocket equation and gave the Russians their beef for rocketry. Um, Fedorov was a theologian. Now, his approach was, yes, we're due to be, find the kingdom of heaven on earth, but we're going to get there because Jesus and God have given us the tools with which to bootstrap ourselves up to it. The first thing is to abolish war and unite all humanity behind a common task. And it seemed to him that the obvious common task was develop immortality, colonize the whole universe, various schemes along the way involving making human beings photosynthesize so they don't have to eat food along the way. Um, he was a bit of an optimist. But his optimism went even further. Um, let us assume that we have colonized the entire universe and made ourselves immortal and independent and you know, post-scarcity. Um, isn't it an affront to somebody in that position to realize that many human beings are dead and mouldering in the grave? Wouldn't it be great if we could figure out how to resurrect them? And furthermore, an awful lot of potential humans who never actually existed are mouldering in virtual graves. Why don't we resurrect everybody who might have lived? <laughs> he wasn't lacking in ambition. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this particular quasi-theological agenda, um, it goes back to the, I guess, response to the uh, post to the Lapsarian ideology. The Scottish Enlightenment of the 18th century, where they sort of got the idea that maybe we can make things better. Rationality, reason, progress through science and engineering. Um, by denying Lapsarianism, you inevitably turn the whole thing on its head and, you know, if you look at it for a prism, the singularity is merely um, 
the, uh, the singularity is, hang on, sorry, brain crash. What was the alternate phrasing of the, of, of the rapture of the nerds? It's the singularity of the god botherers. That's the rapture. Um, pushing it back further, though, we have these outbreaks of apocalyptic thinking um, all throughout early Christendom. Around the year 1000, there was a huge outbreak of groups of peasants sort of burning down, the ch burning down their local church, forming free love communes, or not, as the case may be, and going rampaging all over Europe. Uh, in many cases, raping, looting, and pillaging, because they knew that Jesus was coming back sometime real soon, like maybe next Tuesday. <laughs> it was, after all, the year 1000. Um, and fundamentally, when you trace it all the way back, at least in the Abrahamic tradition, you get to a strong tradition of this sort of apocalyptic eschatological thinking, um, at least to 70 CE, after the burning of the Second, tem of the second Temple. Was it the Second or Third Temple? I, whichever. Got yeah, but at the history of Josephus, um, I did not major on that at college. Um, and it's been with us ever since. Once you get a society that doesn't inevitably believe that everything is in permanent decline, um, or static and unchanging, um, you have the opportunity for cultures where their social outlook it has a divided by zero bug in it. And that's where we went with this novel. So are you going to are you going to start yeah. the reading, Charlie? And um, one sec while I wake this tablet up. Okay. Our protagonist Hugh is um, he starts as a he becomes a she and then things get really complicated. Um, Hugh is a curmudgeonly Welsh environmentalist who doesn't trust any technology more complex than his bicycle, uh, living in the aftermath of a very confusing singularity. And Hugh has been repeatedly summoned for technology jury service, in which representative um, Shay Vapes are called upon to pass judgment on strange downloads broadcast from the cloud of supersentient upload dwellers to the people of Earth to determine whether these can be allowed without rocking the boat too violently. And he's just gotten home back to his pottery shed after one traumatic experience too many, which involved an involuntary sex change along the way, and has been relaxing with a potter's wheel when, well, he was holding her right hand under the cold water tap and swearing when there's another knock at the door. Who is it? She calls down the hall. It's the singularity, a booming voice calls. What do you want? Everything is different now. I don't want any. If I could just have a moment of your time. It takes a lot of skill to make a stentorian voice box emit a credible wheedle, but the bell ringer at the door has clearly practiced it to a fine art. Hugh turns the faucet back up and puts the fingers back into the cold stream. There are vicious little burns, red welts that her honest baseline human cells will take weeks to heal properly. Of course, she could just ride over to the McNanites and get some salve that would make them vanish before her eyes. But Hugh's endured much worse, and she's still got enough stubborn stockpile to last her a couple of aeons. There's another thud at the door. Fud! Fud! Fud, fud, fud! But a transhuman tattoo of fuds in rising frequency. Individual fuds blurring into a composite buzz that gets the bones of the old house rattling in sympathy, shivering down little hisses of plaster dust from the joints in the ceiling. Hugh uses her good hand to turn the faucet off, then wraps a tea towel around her throbbing, dripping fingers and walks to the door, gritting her teeth with every step as she forces herself not to run. It feels like the house might rattle down around her ears any second, but she won't give the infinity botherer outside the, the, the satisfaction. Uh, are these machines I pay break? <laughs> They're making quite a lot of rattle. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Oh, one other question that didn't occur to me to ask before I started reading. Anyone here aged under 12, say? There is bad language coming. Sorry. Okay, I'll continue. Um, Hugh opens the door with the same measured calm. Let one of these fundies know you're on edge, and he'll try to grab the psychological advantage and work it until you agree to hear his spiel. I said, Hugh says, I don't want any. 
I'm afraid I rather must insist, says the Infinity Botherer through his augmented celestial voice box. The force of that voice makes you take an involuntary, wincing step backwards like a blast from an air horn. Hugh, this is mandatory, not optional. This is mandatory, not optional. The words send Hugh whirling back through time, back to her boyhood, and a million repetitions and variations on this phrase from Mum? she asks, jaw dropping as she stares up at the giant Borg on the doorstep. <laughs> it's at least three metres high, silvery and fluid, thin as a schwa, all a shimmer with otherworldly transcendent was name. It's neither beautiful nor handsome, though it's intensely aesthetically pleasing in a way that demands some sort of genderless superlative that no human language has ever invented. Hugh hates it instantly, especially since she suspects that the lower riding it might be descended from one of his awful parents. <laughs> yes, dear, the singularity booms. I like the regendering, it really suits you. Your father would send his best move away if he was still hanging around the solar system. Hugh last saw his parents at their dis disembodiment. They'd already had avatars running around in the cloud for years, dipping into meat space every now and again for a resync with their slow code bio instances, dirt side. When they were finally de deconstituted into a fine powder of component molecules, it had been a technicality, really, a final flourish in their transhumanification. But the finality of it, zeroing out their bodies, had marked a break for Hugh. Mum and Dad were now, finally, technically dead. They were technically alive too, but that was beside the point. Until Mum donned a golem and came for a chat. Mum, I don't talk to dead people, she says. Go away. She deliberately does not slam the door, but closes it and turns the latch and heads back towards the sink, deliberately ignoring the fragment of cloud wearing her mum's memories. She manages to go three steps before the door splinters and tears loose from its hinges, thudding to the painstakingly restored tile floor in the front hall with a merry tinkle of shattering antique glass. Love, I know you're not best pleased to see me, but you've been summoned and that's that. Hang on a sec. The spirit of adolescence descends on you in a red mist. Her mum has always been able to reduce her to a screeching tea kettle of resentment. Get out of my house, mum! I hate you! Her mum's avatar grabs you in a vicious hug that feels like foam rubber padding wrapped around titanium armatures. <coughs> Poor thing, it says. I know it's been hard for you. We did our best, you know, but, well, we were only human. Now, come along, sweetie. Is Tripoli all over again? But this time, the golem whose grasp she can't escape emits a steady stream of basso profundo validations about Hugh's many gifts and talents and how proud her parents are of all she's achieved and such like. Hugh tries to signal a beetle moat, but her mum's got some kind of diplomatic semaphore that makes all the enforcement wear give her a free passage. Mum's bot stops at every traffic signal, and several times Hugh tries to get passers-by to help her with lines like, I'm being kidnapped by the bloody singularity. <coughs> no one seems interested in lending a hand. Even if they did, well. <coughs> Mum goes about 200 kilometers per hour between traffic lights. Her gate so fast that every time Hugh opens her mouth to scream, it fills with wind and her cheeks wibble and wobble while she tries to breathe past the air battering at her windpipe. Then they arrive. The consulate is in mid-fab, and its hairy fractal edges radiate heat as nanites grab matter out of a sky to add to it. <coughs> the actual walls are only waist high, but the spindly plumbing, mains and network infrastructure are already in place and teeter skyward, like a disembodied nervous system filled with dye for an anatomical illustration. <coughs> the console is an infinitely hot and dense dot of eyeball-warping fuzz in the exact centre of what will be the ground floor. <coughs> well, it's not actually infinite, but it does seem to bend the light around it, and it certainly radiates too much heat to approach comfortably. Thank you for coming, it says. You bought your invitation, I hope. Fuck you, no, Hugh screams. She's gathering breath for another outburst, but Mum shakes her. Gently by golem standards, but hard enough to rattle the teeth in her jaws. But I dear, darling. A 
palpable cone of silence descends around Hugh's ear as Mum confides. When I said it was mandatory, I was serious. If you don't comply, it'll delete everybody. But Hugh pauses. Delete? She realises that everything outside the cone of silence has stopped, stuck in a bizarre meat space cognate of bullet time. Birds hanging on the wing in mid-air, leaves frozen in mid-fall, that sort of thing. Yes, dear, I'm not exaggerating. It's come to pay us a visit from the next level. Faster, smarter thinkers than you or I are crapping themselves. Hugh is rattled by this news. Mum always had an accurate appreciation of her own abilities. <coughs> and as a Fields Medal winner, she wasn't inclined to hide them under a bushel. But it's playing by the rules, apparently. There's got to be a public inquiry, which means statements by witnesses and friends of a court and so on and so forth. All very tiresome, I'm sure, but it seems your name came out of a hat first. So I'm afraid you're back on jury duty, like it or not. If it's any consolation, I'll try to make this painless. The birds and the bees resume their respective chirping and buzzing as the cone of silence collapses on Hugh like an icy waterfall of fear. Shit biscuits, she screams, as Mum gently wraps a band of silvery shimmering nano manipulators around Hugh's head and soars off the top of her skull. <laughs> so, could everybody hear that okay? Is that okay? The calling good? Yes. So, as, as you heard, um, uh, Hugh is uh, forcibly uploaded to take part in a uh, trial over the continued existence of the human race and its uh, transcended ancestor, or, or, or uh, descendants, rather. Um, in the scene I'm about to read, uh, he has been taken by this, this sort of distance, dense thinker clade to um, uh, a virtual sim of, uh, of the Burj Khalifa they've built by uh, disassembling Io and the other moons of Jupiter and turning them into Computronium. They have uh, no more style than the, human be than the human race does, and as a result, they've, uh, they've added gorillas as doormen. <laughs> I hope you enjoy the facilities here, says the gorilla with a wink. Nothing but the best for our expert witnesses. We have hot and cold running everything. <laughs> it's a far cry from jury duty accommodation in a crappy backpaster backpacker's hostel in dusty Tripoli. Hugh dials her time right up, sinfully extravagant, and orders the Whirlpool-equipped hot tub with champagne to appear in the bathroom. Then she climbs in to marinate for subjective hours, a handful of seconds in everyone else's frame of reference, and to unkink for the first time in ages. After all, it's not as if she's consuming real resources here, and she needs to relax, recenter her emotions the natural way, and do some serious plotting. Of course, the sim is far too realistic. A virtual champagne bath should somehow manage to keep the champagne dink drinking temperature cold while still feeling warm to the touch. And it shouldn't be sticky and hot and flat. It should feel like champagne does when, it's on your, when it hits your tongue, icy and bubbly and fizzy. And when Hugh's non-bladder feels uncomfortably full and relaxed in the hot liquid and she lets loose a surreptitious stream, it should be magicked away, not instantly blended in with vintage Veuve Co to make an instant tub's worth of pissed mimosa. <laughs> this is what comes of having too much compute time at your disposal. Hugh seethes. In constraint, there is discipline, the need to choose how much reality you're going to import and model. Sitting in an IO's worth of Computronium has freed the galactic authority, and isn't that an unimaginative corker of a name, from having to choose. And with her own self simulated as hot and wide as she can be bothered with, she can feel every unpleasant sensation, each individual sticky bubble, each droplet clinging to her body as she hops out of the tub and into a six-jet steam shower for a top-to-bottom rinse, and then grabs a towel every fiber slightly stiff and plasticky as if fresh out of the wrapper and never properly laundered and dries off. She discovers that she is hyper aware, hyper alert, feeling every grain of knot dust in the knot air individually as it collides with her knot skin. Oh enough, she wants to shout, what is the point of all this rubbish? This is the thing that Hugh has never wanted to admit. Her primary beef against the singularity has never been existential. It's aesthetic. 
<laughs> the power of being of, 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 to be a being of pure thought, the unlimited, unconstrained world of imagination, and we build a world of animated gifs, stupid sight gags, late, lame van art avatars, brain dead playful environments, and, a, and brain dead flame wars, augmented by animated emoticons that allow participants to express their hackneyed ad hominems concern trollery and violations of Godwin's law through the media of cartoon animals and oversized animated genitals. <laughs> whether or not Sim Hugh is really Hugh, whether or not uploading is a kind of death, whether or not post-humanity is immortal or only kidding itself, the single inviolable fact that remains, human sim space is no more tasteful than the, than the architectural train wreck that the galactic authority has erected. The people who live in it have all the aesthetic sense of a senile jackdaw. He was prepared to accept, for the sake of argument, mind you, that uploading leaves your soul intact, but she is never going to give one nanometer on the question of whether uploading leaves your taste intact. If the Turing test measured an AI's capacity to conduct itself with a sense of real style, all of SimSpace would be revealed for a machine sham. Give humanity a truly unlimited field, and it will fill it with, a happy, me with, a, with happy meal toys and holographic sports star collectible, tr collectible, bleh, collectible trading game art. There's a whole gang of dirt side refuseniks who make this their primary objection to transcendence. They're severe Bauhaus cosplayers, so immaculate and plainly turned out that they look more like illustrations than humans. Hughes never felt any affinity for them. They're too cringeworthy, too like southern bells who come down with the vapors at the sight of a fish knife laid where the dessert fork is meant to go. It has always felt unserious to object to a major debate over human evolution with an argument about style. But Hugh appreciates their point and has spent his and then her entire life complaining instead about the ineffable and undefinable humanness that is lost when someone departs for the cloud. She's turned her back on her parents, refused to take their calls from beyond the grave. She shut herself up in her pottery with only the barest vestige of a social life, remade herself as someone who is both a defender of humanity and a committed misanthrope. All the while, she's insisted, mostly to herself, because, as she now sees with glittering clarity, no one else ever gave a shit, that the source of her concern all along was metaphysical. The reality that stares her in the face now as she reclines on the impeccably rendered 20 million count non-Egyptian, non-cotton, non-sheets <laughs> is that it's always been a perfectly normal, absolutely subjective, totally meaningless argument over color schemes. <laughs> and now she has existential angst. The Burj Khalifa's in-room TV gets an infinity of channels, evidently cross-wired from the cable feed for Hilbert's hotel. <laughs> it uses some evolutionary computing system to generate new programs on the fly every time you press the channel up button. This isn't nearly as banal as you imagined it might be when she read about it on the triangular folded, uh, triangular folded cardboard stand-up that materialized in her hand as she reached for the remote. That's because, as the card explained, the Burge has enough computation to model captive versions of Hue at extremely high speed and to tailor the program by sharpening its teeth against these instances in a bottle so that every press of the button brings up eye-catching, attention-snaring material. It's mostly soft-core pornography that involves pottery. <laughs> Hugh would like nothing better than to relax with the goggle box and let her mind be lovingly swaddled in intellectual flannel, but her mind is not having any of it. The more broadly parallel she runs, the more metacognition she finds herself indulging in, so that even as she lies abed, propped up by a hill of pillows the size of a Celtic burial mound, her thoughts are doing something like this. Ooh, that's interesting. Never thought of doing that sort of thing with glaze. Too interesting if you ask me. It's not natural, that sort of interesting. They've got to be simulating giga hues to come up with that sort of real-time optimization. There'll be hordes of hue instances being subjected to much less interesting versions of this program and winking out of existence as soon as they get bored. <laughs> Hell, I could be one of those instances, my life dangling on a frayed thread of attention. Every time I press the channel up button, I execute thousands, millions, billions of copies of myself. 
Why don't I care more about them? It's insane and profligate cruelty, but here's me blithely pressing the channel up button. Whoa, that's interesting. She looks awfully like Bonnie, but with a bum that's a little bit more like that girl I fancied in college. I could die at any instant just by losing attention and pressing channel up. Huh, that's wild. I never noticed those muscles. What are they, quadratus lumborum? Springing out when someone's working at a pottery wheel. That bloke's got QLs for days. If I were really ethically opposed to this sort of thing, I'd be vomiting in my mouth at the thought, with rage at the thought of all these virtual people springing into existence and being snuffed out. But I'm not, am I? Hypocrite, liar, poser, mincing aesthete, that's me. So long as it's interesting and stylish, I'll forgive anything. I have as much existential introspection as a Mario sprite. <laughs> Enough already, she tells herself, and cools herself down to a single thread, then slows it down, hunting for that sweet spot at the junction of stupidity and calm. Then finding it, she settles down and watches TV for 100 subjective years, slaughtering invisible hordes of herself without a moment's thought. Satori. Thank you. And now we have just over 20 minutes to entertain your questions. Sam? Uh, yeah. Uh, how did you divide the labor between uh, writing the book? And is the book made of comments? So I wrote all the consonants and Charlie wrote the vowels. <laughs> yes. Actually, we played ping pong with a manuscript. I'd write 500 words, but I'd throw it at Corey underhand. and. He'd catch it and write another 500 words and throw it back. And you know, we re developed really big biceps throwing them back and forth between Edinburgh and London. And we, and did, we used email. We, and we used uh, text files, uh, lightly, uh, lightly marked up, you know, de marked down, uh, marked up uh, uh, plain text files. Um, Charlie keeps version control through uh, an automated backup. Uh, I actually have a little uh, set of Git scripts called Flashbake. They're on GitHub. Every 15 minutes, they take all my working files and they diff them and they put them in a little version version store on my laptop and they log um, the weather where I am, uh, where they figure out where I am from my IP address, the last three songs I listened to and like the last three things I put up on Boing Boing as a kind of time capsule of what I've written in the last 15 minutes. So you can download those scripts and use them too. So we do have a, a great palimpsest of how this book matured over the years. As whether it's Creative Commons license, it is. I've just been at Burning Man so I haven't had a chance to put up the website. Uh, when I get back from this tour, I'll have a few days in London, and I'll sort that out. Other questions? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Oh, hey, Hal. Uh, I hear little bits of true names peeking through there. Um, talk about that a little bit. Influence, you know, reuse. I guess so. I, I wrote this other novella, True Names, with Benjamin Rosenbaum. Um, who's like a, a much more hyper version of Charlie, which is hard to imagine someday. Um, and uh, it deals with similar themes. I guess there's bits of that peeking through. Yeah, I guess it's you're right. It's impossible really to do a modern singularity story without referencing Vern at some level. Yeah. Even if it's not an overt reference to true names. Um, it'd be like trying to write a, a time machine story, with a, time, a time travel story, without actually referencing H.G. Wells or Isaac Asimov at some mm -hmm. level. Yeah. Um, oh, no. oh. Oh. yeah, did you have a question? No, no, no. you have a question. Um, <coughs> sorry, you had mentioned earlier uh, during the, you, sorry, when you had mentioned the burning of the temples in regards to the changing perception of knowledge and growth and sort of free singularity, singularity, um, do, or does the Gnosticism in any way influence how you guys sort of approach the newness of knowledge, the newness of technology, and sort of how people are so the question is, does Gnostic thought influence the way we think about new about technology? Narcissism. narcissism or Gnosticism? Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Uh, okay. th yeah, I, I, I come from a land without an aspirated R, so I'm better at parsing that sort of homonym. Um, so uh, does Gnosticism, uh, Gnostic thought influence the way that we think about new technology and the way people relate to it? Take it away, Charlie. <laughs> I think it's fairly clear that um, the way we approach new technology, the way we slot it into our own, um, having a senior moment here looking for the right word, how we slot it into our own outlook and our own model of the world around us is very dependent on our philosophical approach and outlook to life. But. Um, 
I'm not an expert on Gnosticism. It doesn't come out of my cultural. It doesn't come into my personal cultural heritage. I, I give that an eight out of ten. You nailed the dismount. Very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, this one's a more Charlie. Uh, how, how did uh, how did Accelerando and the response to it affect uh, this? Um. Quite a lot, at least on my case. Um, the question was, how did Accelerando and response to it affect this novel? Um, I would have to say that I would be very happy if people would read Accelerando and The Rapture of the Nerds back to back, taking The Rapture of the Nerds as either the unicorn chaser or the whoopee cushion surprise. <laughs> that sounds good to me. I like that formulation. Uh, so does this take place in the physical world, anyway, on the same timeline as Accelerando? No. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, kind of harking back to the true names and I guess Gnosticism, does the solipsist equation play into uh, Rapture of the Nerds at all? Does the solipsist equation play into the nat Rapture of the Nerds? Um, you know, the, the, uh, I, I think that um, the problem with singularity is a, is a solipsistic problem, but it's, it's not just a solipsism of, a solipsism of how do I know that the rest of you exist. It's also the solipsism of how do I know that I exist? Um, where is the locus of my identity? So imagine that uh, you were going to upload a copy of yourself into uh, a computer, and before you walked away from it, you wanted to make sure that you had a clean and faithful copy. So you need some way to interrogate that copy and make sure it was really you. So you could do a Turing test. You could have like two Chinese rooms, and you could be in one, and the copy could be in the other, and someone could ask both of you questions. And if the answers were the same, if you responded to stimulus in identical ways, or near identical ways, you'd say, okay, the copies are faithful. So that sounds like a, a, a reasonably good way of, of kind of evaluating these copies. And there's a, there's a kind of uh, singularitarian uh, a uh, Socratic dialogue where you have a skeptic and a guru and the skeptic says, you can't put my brain in a computer, it won't really be me anymore. And the guru says, ah, but if I cut off your leg and gave you a robot leg, it'd still be you, right? And the, the person says, well, yes, but where are you going with this? And the guru says, well, what if I cut your leg off a few inches higher? And he says, oh, well, yes, I guess I'd still be me. And inch by inch, they proceed up until they reach the brain stem. And he says, now are you still you? And he says, yes, and okay, now we're going to slice your brain stem millimeter by millimeter and work our way all the way up to your frontal lobe. When do you stop being you? And at that point, enlightenment is attained. But of course, it's not true, right? If you are a concert pianist and I, uh, a pianist, and I cut your hands off, uh, and then, um, and then uh, stuck you in a box and you without your hands in a box and interrogated you about all the things that mattered to you, concert pianist minus hands would have some pretty important different answers relative to concert pianist with hands. Likewise, if I, if I waited 10 years and stuck you in a box, you 10 years ago and you 10 years from now, totally different answers. There is some st sense in where the rubber meets, meets the road, where you actually want to figure out if you're still you, where we actually have no idea where the locus of identity is, and, and where we are discontinuous with ourselves, right? Uh, from moment to moment we're continuous. You and you a moment later, assuming I haven't chopped your hands off in the intervening moment, are, are still you, um, but just like Latin moment to moment is intelligible as it emerges into French, and then by the time it's French, it's not intelligible as Latin anymore, given enough time or, or a, a, an event of enough significance, you cease to be you. And so this question of who you are is one that we've never had to answer because we've never had the question of, is that still me? Uh, to have to answer minus a few kind of extreme brain insults or you know, amnesia or you know, thriller plots. We've never really had that to, to um, as a matter of social policy, just to determine for millions of people whether they are still them. And it may be, in fact, that that, that that will have to be answered. And certainly, the literature contemplates it. And I think that it reveals the extent to which the singularity elides the most important question of all, which is, who are we? Um, and, and where are we? Where is the locus of our identity? And it's, it's one of the things that we explore a bit in this book. However, <clears throat> I'd like to add a new thought which just occurred to me while Corey was talking, because I've heard this for about three times now. Yes. Yes. And I'm still generating new thoughts, which means I am not the same I that was hearing this a couple yeah. of days ago. Um, one important issue to consider is the split between sort of an Apollonian, Apollonian model of human existence and the Dionysian one. Are we creatures of the senses or creatures of reason? Um, you know, you may well get a very different answer to the identity question, you know, are you the same person, depending on which version you evaluate it from. Mm. 
Um, one can certainly make the argument that, that you will perceive colours, tastes, whatever, the same way in an up if uploaded and in a sim, but you would in real life, because we just fine-tune the sim to feed you the same um, sensory inputs. However, your psychological processing of the colour red, knowing that you are living in a sim that you're a mind upload, may be subtly altered from your processing of that in the flesh, simply by knowing of your condition. Mm. Good point. It, it's hair splitting all the way down. Uh, in the back there. Um, there was a nice call on the uh, that's staying umbrella in pretty now. Oh, hey, it's you. Hi, how are you? It's not bad, life's good. I had a question about stuff. So, <laughs> um, a lot of science fiction is it's the present, but we have cooler stuff. But the way I see technology advancing things is actually a paradigm shift faster and faster until you know, tomorrow we realize we have a brand new way of communication that we have to deal with, and the next day there's a new one. Um, how do you write relatable things realizing that? You know, 100 years in the future, things will probably keep accelerating until each day will be like far from the distant future. The, the question is broadly, how do we stop the uh, future from overtaking the futuristic? Is that, is that a good summary? Yeah. Yeah. We don't. We do the best we can with the tools we have available, and we know that in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, in 100 years' time, people will point and mock. This is the writer's condition. I, I feel like technology, like science fiction, has never been very good at predicting the future. I mean, if you actually look at its track record, you know, it's basically a Monte Carlo sim. It's throwing darts. Um, you know, practically all the things that science fiction claims as, as successful predictions are either trivial or actually inspirations. Right? Gene Roddenberry didn't predict that Nokia's engineers would build flip phones. He inspired them to. Right? They were all, you know, fans of Star Trek. Right? Um, so. You know, that said, I, I do think that you learn a lot about um, our fears and aspirations for technology, which is really one of the burning existential questions for a society in, in this technological era. What are we really thinking about technology by reading science fiction? It kind of exposes this collective unconscious a little bit because science fiction worlds are thought experiments in which a single technology grows to total prominence. Um, not because that's a, an accurate rendition of, of some plausible future, but for the same reason that when you go to the doctor, she takes a swab and touches the back of your throat and then leaves it in a petri dish over the weekend. Because when you let it multiply till it's visible through a naked eye, you can learn things about it. So we build these worlds in a bottle uh, that, are, that are thought experiment worlds in which a technology has become totally totalizing, totally prominent. But not because we think it'll get there, but because we think you can learn something about it by blowing it up to that size. In the same way that a, you know the old physicist joke, assume a perfectly spherical cow of uniform density. <laughs> However, um, as a writer to that, um, you've got to bear in mind that science fiction writers are creatures of their time and their culture. What a science fiction writer in, say, South Korea makes of a particular technology will not be the same that a science fiction writer in, say, Venezuela makes of it, or one in the UK, or one in America. Um, also, our cultural background informs our attitude to um, the near future. Um, it's been said recently, a lot of contemporary science fiction is really, really, really grim and gloomy and dystopian, and the phrase grim meat hook future has been coined for it. Um, I would like to submit that a chunk of that is because we're going through the worst economic depression since the 1930s. And during economic depressions, people are depressed. <laughs> their friends are unemployed, or they're, having to, or they're not making ends meet well, or things are going wrong. Um, people who are depressed, or people who... Or write, well, writers who are surrounded by people who are chronically stressed due to social constraints will themselves exhibit signs of stress and depression and write, and they'll work it out on paper, the way writers have always done. Mm. Yeah. Um, since we were talking about uh, singularity that assumes that we're turning into data, how much into this idea of singularity does the concept of an operating system to read the data and all the concerns about data, such as security or privacy or manipulability, play into this entire what, what's the operating system for the singularity? How much of it can be manipulated? What's the security model? You, you, you sure. have a lot of input so, on that. So we actually uh, explore this a bit in the book. There, there's a, a notion out of computer security, sort of very, very uh, 
long, long held as a theoretical idea and now uh, somewhat practically implemented in one of the BSD kernels called capabilities computing, which is a, you can, you can it's a, there's a good Wikipedia entry on it. And capabilities computing is a model for securing computers uh, through a, a kind of um, a game theory constraint. So we have a bar in, in the third volume of this book, the third section of this book, that's a capabilities bar where all the simulated people uh, enter a kind of uh, tokenized game that determines whether they can get drunk and whether they can fight with each other and what happens when they fight with each other and so on. And the way that the game works, it's constructed out of smart contracts and the program stops running if you violate the, stock, uh, the smart contract and everything unwinds back to when the bar started. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fun little conceit and it's, there's a murder that takes place in it, which is uh, how it all works. Yeah, and, and then we're down to five minutes, so we'll take all the remaining questions and then answer as many as we can. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, why don't we start over there, because I haven't called on that side for a while, and then we'll get to you, I promise. Is that me? Yep. Uh, all right. Uh, I want to just follow on your answer about splitting the nerves a little bit. Um, were there any uh, big ideas in the novel that you guys maybe fundamentally disagreed about or had some disagreements about? Um, and if so, how did they affect the, the, uh, the outcome? Yeah, we got along like a house on fire mostly. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right, so what I'd like to do is take everybody's question then and answer as many as we can in the next five minutes. Can we do that? So hands up if you have a question. Isabel, did you still have a question? Well, I mean, you sort of asked my question. I wasn't, very, I wasn't thinking about the big issues, but really more the little issues. It's like an eco question. Like, it seems like one's taste in reading material can be very specific and that the writing process would be very personal. Did you just like total hands off each other's stuff or were you... We right. were angry, like, don't, don't stick it like So, that. question the first, did we edit each other's yeah. stuff? Uh, is this in any way a response to Spider Robinson's uh, start answer sort of trilogy? Because it feels like... Right, okay. So is this a response to start answer? Yeah. How are you guys doing on this tour together? <laughs> How's the tour? Are we strangling each other yet? Uh, is there any more? Just go ahead. All right, yeah, go ahead. I just wondered if you guys has, has had any thoughts about how quickly 3D printing will be rolled out, how disruptive it's going to be. Sorry? How disruptive will 3D printing be? <laughs> All right, and then last question. Is there any hope that we'll develop this advanced technology and not use it for banal, stupid things like television? Well, we, if we develop this technology, will we not use it for banal, stupid things like television? All right, uh, do you want to start? Charlie? Um, hang on, with which question? Any of any or all of them, as many as you'd okay. like to answer. The question on 3D printers, um, <laughs> wrong book. If you want my take on 3D printing and its potential as a disruptive technology, I have a novel out there now called Rule 34. <laughs> yes, it that Rule 34. But it goes into, among other things, various forms of print crime. Uh, yeah, um, my, sorry, go ahead. My book about it is, is Makers, and I, I, think, I think it will be disruptive and interesting. Thank you, Samuel. Samuel has a copy there. He's modeling it, Vanna White. <laughs> uh, now, arguments. No, we were actually pretty good about, about editing each other's stuff, and every now and again, one of us would write a volley where the other one would go, you know, that just totally doesn't work. Uh, I'm going to just chop it off and save it in an offcuts folder, and we'll start over again. We were generally pretty good. There were a couple of times, I think, during appeals court, where we actually got on the phone and talked, which is quite yeah. an alarming step well, for both had, of us. Well, we had to do the hands-off thing, step back for a little bit, and then figure out what, where we're not seeing eye to eye, and then yeah. synchronize. And then, uh, is there a chance that, TV, that, that the singularity won't be as banal as TV? I think it'll be all of them, right? I think it will be banal and noble and all the rest of it. I think that, you know, um, like the, the lesson of living in London and seeing how beautiful uh, Victorian tenements are is that if you want to make something beautiful, you make a million horrible things and then wait a hundred years until almost all of them have fallen down and the ones that remain will have a patina of beautifulness. Yeah, people uh, will chuck away the grim ones and keep the good ones. And I, what was the remaining question? Um, start, start, start answer. No, not really. Not, not read it. I think that we, the first book years ago. I think we probably plumbed the same source, which is Podcane of Mars, the, the Heinlein novel, because you know he's a big he's a big Heinlein nut, uh, and uh, and you know Podcane of Mars. Spoilers: it's a 50-year-old novel, but but spoilers ends with uh, the galactic civilization calling them in for a tribunal, and it's a it's a hoary idea out of science fiction literature that we, we wanted to kind of revisit. Are you oh, sure that was Podcan and Mars or, or yeah, Half Space It Will Travel? Oh, Half Space It Will Travel, sorry. Yeah. And then the, the last bit was, are we strangling each other yet? I think we're doing okay. So far, so good. Yeah, it's just been a couple of days. 
We're both <laughs> we're we're both a bit burned out. Charlie was just at Worldcon, and I was I was at Burning Man. So we we both had a, a somewhat exhausting, uh, overstimulated. Uh, uh, yeah, and we're now of, we're now of, doomed to a sequence of 5 a.m. alarm calls. Yeah, yeah. I actually hopped the fence into the pool at our hotel in Lexington, Kentucky, this morning, and had to swim at 5 a.m. before the plane. So. Absolutely. Are you recovering from the airport? How am I recovering from the airport? It wasn't so bad. I mean, it was just mildly bad. Although the TSA guy told us, uh, why don't you want to use the porno scanner? Don't you know that it's just like sonar? <laughs> <laughs> and, and weirdly enough, his name was Ballard. I'll never forget that. <laughs> All right, so uh, now we're ready to render some books non-returnable. There yep. is a bookseller over there. Um, they, We'll sign Let me just get some pens. So, Corin Charlie, we made these things for you to give to anybody who buys or brings a book to sign. All right. Mm -hmm. Listen to that. You, you, you get a book. You get a head. Yeah. Wow. Give him a round of applause.